I've heard the story, but I want everyone else to have this, heard the story of the origin of this amazing magazine. And I know it was a physical magazine, but it was much more than that. So I'd love you to take us back to Amsterdam, 1985, 80, no, 88, uh, founding of Electric Word, and then bring us to the birth of Wired Magazine. Okay. Um, God, it's such a long time ago. Uh, let's see. So my, it's a love story. Uh, amazingly enough. Um, I had moved to Amsterdam to be with my partner, Louis Rossetto. Louis had been hired by a uh, translation company that was uh, doing translation software uh, for, um, for the large part for technical companies that had big documentation burdens. And so these were companies, a lot of them were American companies coming to Europe and had to localize um, their documentation. And so from that concept of, of you know, large amounts of data that have to be um, technically uh, communicated and translated. Um, the, public, the, the founder of the company said, well, let's do a magazine, you know, that, that talks about this. And Lewis said, with the goal of selling more translation software packages, he's like, why don't you put some salespeople on the road? But all translators would be publishers. And so thus was born. At the time, it was called Language Technology, which is a really catchy title. Right. And, um, and so Lewis started publishing this magazine. And you know, over the course of the years that it was published, it was evolving to ultimately be about um, man-machine interface. And so we covered all of the technologies that dealt with everything from speech synthesis and handwriting recognition and speech recognition, all the way through um, archiving and storage and retrieval of information, um, up to things like um, neuro-linguistic programming and uh, machine translation and so forth. So it was this amazing way of thinking about how technology was going to help us communicate and, um, and think. And at a certain point, um, the, publisher, the publisher of the magazine, who was actually a translation company, sold to Walters Kluver, and they're like, what is this magazine? Uh, and that was sort of our, um, our freedom ticket. And so we, at that point, had come to San Francisco, to Macworld, um, and seen the future of desktop publishing. And we got this in our minds that, you know, these technologies that we discovered at Macworld were going to transform <clears throat> the world. And so we came back and started thinking about it and thought, what if Electric Word was not just a sort of business-to-business -business publication? What if it were actually going to address the larger implications of this change? And so that's how Wired was born. And so you told me that uh, coming up with the name uh, Wired, how you outlined the vision of what it would be. What did you envision for Wired? What was its original mission and vision? And What's kind of ironic is you celebrated the 25th anniversary last year. A uh, couple of months ago. Of, of, of Wired. So tell us a little bit about what that, you know, both how it came to fruition and what made you imagined Wired to be describing in 1992. Well, that's a good point because the first issue of the magazine didn't talk about the internet. <laughs> um, and in fact, Nicholas Negroponte, who wrote the, um, the column for five years for the magazine, on the back page had a, this made-up address, internet address. It was like Nicholas at internet, you know? <laughs> it's like, what? Um, because at the time, we were talking about multimedia, we were talking about all these other things, and, you know, there was no graphic user interface for, um, for the web. Mosaic hadn't launched yet, and so... Um, you know, we were talking to the future about networking, but um, it literally happened. Um, I mean, I think the, the first Mac interface for the web was, um, was 1994, Mosaic. And by October of 94, um, we had started an internet division. So we were, um, and of course that was before anything existed. So we were doing original content on the web, which meant that we had to develop all the tools for it as well. Um, so the vision was, always that um, we were revolutionaries. And, you know, Electric Word had been for word workers. And I had a little t-shirt that said, word workers of the world unite, you know? Because um, we were trying to pull all these people together from all these different um, disciplines. And that experience really helped with Wired because with Wired we were going into all these different communities, not just computer science, but, um, you know, business and entertainment and education and design. And we were sort of hand-picking our audience. And uh, so the idea was, let's find the smartest people in all of these spaces who are focused on the future, who are trying to figure out how to use technology to do their jobs better, um, and pull them all together into a community, and let's, like, dream about the future. 
and build it. And let's and, see what that looks like. And what is that? Did, did that future, we were talking a little bit in the green room, did the future that you described in 1992 come true? So when we... Exactly the way you described oh, it. Oh, exactly. <laughs> I am really good at pegging it exactly. Um, you know, we were unabashedly um, enthusiastic and optimistic about what technology could do. And anything that was good for the internet would be good for humanity. And it would certainly be good for the investors. Um, and, you know, the people that were, we were with were very mission-driven, you know, the people that we were meeting. Uh, and, of course, being in San Francisco, you know, there was this whole sort of art and culture aspect to it as well that was just a very ripe, um, um, combustible kind of excitement and energy. Um, you know, I think 25 years later, we see what happens when you move fast and break things. And, you know, this is a really interesting moment in time, um, you know, particularly looking at some of the crazy things that happened last year, or of course the last couple of years, you know, whether it's, um, you know, in, in Facebook terms, you know, or whether you're talking about medical terms, you know, this guy using CRISPR to, to do things that are um, exciting from a scientific point of view, but completely unfounded, like no unmet medical yeah. need, not, not enough um, <clears throat> vetting, not enough communicating with you know, the people about the risks involved. So I think we have to be um, more circumspect. And I think, you know, technology continues to move our, our um, species forward, our society forward. Uh, but we need a few more guardrails. Um, and we need feedback mechanisms. So, you know, it's interesting. I, I always, you know, I, I kind of thought I was a geek reading Wired magazine and always excited about it because it was almost as this, this really nice balance between the future, but yet it was w things that were happening today, but that wasn't being written about in mainstream media. Um, that description of, like you talk about Facebook and some of the issues that are having now, um, there's a lot of people now screaming about a lot of the misuse of a lot of this technology. Um, how do you bridge that gap between achieving the future, but yet dealing with today, and also that right balance? Because it seems like Wired always struck that right balance where it wasn't, you know, it didn't make that message pessimistic, but yet had such a realistic optimi uh, um, uh, optimism. So, you know, it's interesting because um, my new enterprise, Neolife, um, is, has been launched at a time of a fairly extraordinary amount of pessimism. You know, and I feel like um, 25 years ago, we, we scoured the landscape looking for positive visions of the future <clears throat> and found none. You know, we were at war in the Gulf, um, the economy was in the toilet, uh, and cyberpunk fiction had painted a very dystopian vision of the future. And, you know, I think there were some happy times in between, <laughs> but now we're back to a fairly dystopian vision of the future. And um, I think with Neolife, we're trying very hard to have a vision of the future that we work towards, because that's what happens. You know, our science fiction writers create these futures for us, and then we subconsciously build those futures. And so the image that you put out is what you're working towards. And you know, it's easy to say, um, you know, as a writer, a publisher, let's think about the future. How do you do that as an entrepreneur and an investor, you know, who's got quarterly reports or annual or, you know, a five-year venture firm or whatever uh, goal or whatever it may be. Um, and, you know, I think it's important that we keep the long term firmly in view, um, but it's impossible to get funding for that kind of research. And so, you know, what we have to come up with is not just the thing that's going to enhance us, but we have to come up with short-term goals. You have to have the long-term and the short-term goal and a short-term deliverable that instead of perhaps taking us from a baseline to enhanced, takes us from um, you know, somebody struggling to regain speech or motility or something like that. So if you're working on a brain-computer interface, for instance, let's think forward to a time when mind reading and, and so forth is, is happening. But in the meantime, let's figure out how to help people walk and talk and and so forth. So you've got to have the revenue goals um, spread out over time. So um, our chairman, Jerry Levin, always talks about this notion of words matter and that everything is about the words you choose. What does that look like for Neolife? And, and maybe unpack a little bit of more about what Neolife is, because for those who don't already subscribe, you should. Thank you. Um, but describe Neolife, and then as Jerry says, the words you choose to describe what you were just describing. Talk about how that leads what you're doing at Neolife and beyond. So um, a couple of years ago, um, my mother and father and stepfather, um, between the three of them in their 80s, uh, experienced both um, mental illness and um, cognitive decline. And it got me thinking about um, what is the future of neuroscience and what are we going to do when, you know, 
a large percentage of our population has Alzheimer's and what's the impact going to be and what is technology doing to, to help that? And I began to go to conferences and read books and see what technology was doing. And I met extraordinary people. And I thought, these are the most powerful people on the planet. You know, they've, they've got, sure, technical skills, but they've got 15 years, you know, of study into all these um, deep areas like neuroscience and genetics and, um, and the microbiome and, you know, all these things. And all of a sudden I thought, this feels very familiar. This looks just like the world did to me at the end of the 80s. Um, and I feel like we're at another point um, of, of inflection where the science is advanced to a certain point and the technology is pushing way past that. And it's giving us this opportunity to envision things that were science fiction up until now. And so, um, you know, what we're trying to do, we're, so we're calling it another revolution. We're calling it a neobiological revolution. And it is, you know, mankind being um, suddenly having the technology that could alter our evolution um, on a very, very, very short time frame. And when we first launched a year and a half ago, it was like, you know, within our lifetimes. And it's like, well, within the next five years, it's like, within the next six months, you know? So these, this kind of compression on, um, on evolution is, is really interesting and um, important because it's, it's unknowable if you're in, intimidated by science, unknowable if you're intimidated by technology. And yet, we are going to be called upon to have opinions about all these things. And you know, the scientists, in this case, do not want to make these decisions on their own. And so I'm really impressed by somebody like Kevin Esfeldt, you know, who's been working on uh, uh, the problem of Lyme disease transmission and has basically been talking about gene drives with the people of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard and saying, here's how it works. And if, if, if you want to move forward, you know, you're, you're in the driver's seat. We can move forward. If you don't, we'll stop. But you guys get to decide. And I'm really motivated by that. And so the word you chose for the name of this next project you're working on is Neolife. Yeah. Where'd that come from? Well, um, so my partner, one of my, our founders of, uh, of Wired, our founding executive editor was <clears throat> Kevin Kelly, who at the time uh, was writing a book called um, Out of Control. And the tagline was something like, fast forward into a neobiological civilization. And so I picked his book up again, and I'm reading it, and he's talking about the merger of technos and, and logos, you know, the merger of life and technology. And I was so inspired by it, and it must have been tucked away somewhere in the back of my head for 25 years. Um, but yeah, so that, that was the inspiration. And, um, you know, I, I think this idea that you get to talk about the future, you mentioned entrepreneurs um, in, a few minutes ago about the struggle of what fundraising and other obstacles they face, sometimes to shrink their vision, to shrink down to something more realistic and more achievable. Um, how do you recommend and how have you learned, if you could go back and talk to, you know, people over the last 25 years that struggle with this as well, but today entrepreneurs facing this always you know, always facing this obstacle of shrinking what they're describing down. Um, what I want to kind of capture is the essence of, I think, your message about making sure that you're not um, sacrificing what you believe in mm. today for what's possible tomorrow. Mm. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like there are some heuristics that we need to establish um, as a community and guidelines. I mean, we're talking about literally designing the future of our species. And so what do we want that to look like? And what are our values? What do we care about? Um, you know, these are really difficult, complex conversations that, that need to be had. And um, if, if we are focused on short-term uh, goals, we might make the wrong choices. And you build on what you start with. And so, you know, in computer systems, you have something called legacy systems, you know, like MS-DOS, you know, that Jaron Lanier, a virtual reality pioneer and, and great thinker about technology, talks about the sedimentation effect. And whatever you start with, you basically alter and build upon, but that's your foundation. And so I think the choices that we make now, the companies that we fund, the research that we support now is sort of you know, showing us the map of the way we're going to go forward. So I think we have to choose wisely. So you, you write a little bit about this, but I want to kind of have you extrapolate. Um, in issue three of Startup Health Magazine, uh, great article by Jane. If you haven't read it yet, you all have Startup Health Magazine. Tell us a little bit about what you were thinking as you 
um, both started on and wrote the terrific piece that um, I think is, I hope, becomes a regular part of the magazine, by the way, you know, your contribution. Oh, oh um, But that. really outlines, I think, something that entrepreneurs working on achieving health moonshot need to, need to think about every day. Well, it, it, it really does have to do with this where are we going sort of thing. And, you know, right now it's just, there's a wide open field. There's so many different scientific, you know, discoveries and capabilities, you know, and I sort of feel like um, we're, we're sort of out ahead of the science sometimes, you know, we see a business opportunity that isn't necessarily really grounded in the science yet. Um, and so we've got these technology tools um, and we're trying to build businesses around them. Um, but I think what we really need to be focused on is what do we want the future of our species to look like? And I feel like we don't have a strategic plan for that. We don't have a creative brief. And that maybe that's where we start. It's like, where are we going? Do, do, you, know, do you want to um, prevent disease? Do you want to genetically alter your children to prevent disease from being inherited? Most people you know, in this room would probably say yes. People in another room uh, with religious or cultural or other perspectives might not feel that way. Um, you know, famously at a CRISPR uh, conference, uh, they were talking about uh, editing out uh, deaf embryos. Um, and in America, people say, why would we do that? We would welcome more deaf people into the community. In China, they're like, no, we would terminate that. <laughs> And so, you know, these are going to be really different conversations happening all over the world at different times with different cultural backgrounds, religious, philosophical backgrounds. So, um, you know, what does that product roadmap look like? And what you want to do is position your company for um, the best possible outcome for Homo sapiens. But interestingly, we may not have been talking about Homo sapiens. Within our lifetimes, we may be talking about some fundamentally different species. And that's what's really interesting to think it. about. I love it. So um, before we wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about what you haven't written about yet that you've seen in health that you're going to be writing about next. What should, what, what, give us a little preview. Wow. Um, well, we have a story coming out on Thursday, which is really interesting. Um, there's a neuroscientist named David Eagleman, and he started a company called Neosensory. And so we have a, a story about um, how he is using technology to explore new ways of perceiving the world around us. And so we have our five senses. We have the technologies that can help people who are suffering from perceptual deficits to get back to that. But what he's working on is literally creating new ways of perceiving things. And so he's got a wearable for um, people who are hard of hearing that takes uh, the different decibels and translates them to different um, haptic uh, points on your, um, on your bracelet so that you can start to go, ah, that tone touches me here and that tone touches me here. He's got a vest that helps you map visually. Um, they, they, they can outline, let's say, a, a dog on your back and you go, wow, I think that's a dog. And so you can teach yourself these new senses. Um, so what if they start doing that with data sets? You know, what if you get your Twitter feed or your financial information or, you know, your mother's <clears throat> or your children's, you know, vital signs, you know, pumped into you in some alternate way. So the future of sensory perception is, is definitely one of those things we're interested in. Um, gosh, there's so many stories. I mean, I, you know, on a much more prosaic level, I'm really interested in, you know, the economic um, uh, dynamics. When will insurance companies realize that an investment in preventive medicine is actually going to have a, har uh, a higher ROI than paying for people after the fact? Um, or understanding as a healthcare provider um, where the boundaries are between, um, you know, what your service is and what the things that are causing people to experience bad health are. And so what do those boundaries look like and how do they blur? Yeah, I know. In fact, Todd, Todd and Ed Park were here yesterday from Devoted Health talking about that's their entire model, which is the you know, before and taking care of everybody like you would want to take care of your mother. And it was actually about going ahead of before they, uh, before they get sick. And, and well, that's right. And so do you sequence your child yeah. at birth? Yeah. You know, and why would you not do that? Yeah. Um, we were talking about cord blood before, which, uh, you know, cord blood. you were saying when your children were born 19, 20 years ago, it was a novel idea to actually store your cord blood. Yeah, my midwife and the, the OBGYN at the hospital were like, what are we doing with this thing, you know? And 
Um, now it's like my kid. I said to my kids, we only know that the the cryogenics, you know, are the cells will be viable for 15 years, you know. And when they turned 16, I said, so what do you want to do with their core blood? And they're like, keep it. We're not donating it. Right. Actually, it's interesting. How many people who've had children in the last like 10 years have kept the cord blood? Right. So we were talking about. So it. you don't even know about this because okay. if you knew, so, you would do this. So I thought every. So I heard about it 15 years ago when I had my first daughter from a friend who had been, you know, obviously knew, and I didn't even know what it was. So we've done it for all three of our girls. But um, we were talking a little bit about that. I thought it was more complex. I thought more hands would be raised. Will we talk about that for two seconds before we wrap up. Sure. I mean, these are stem cells. These are some of the most valuable um, biological material that exists in the world that can be turned into almost any cell. They can even be turned into artificial gametes, you know, so that you could basically um, create an embryo, you know, from your stem cells. And they're, they're used, if not for you, they can be used for somebody else. They can be used in, um, in Parkinson's disease. They can be used for all sorts of possibilities. And so why would you not store that? And they are rich in the umbilical cord. And so there is a process at birth where you can harvest those cells and then cryogenically preserve them. And you know, they used to only, when we did it 20 years ago, they only had research saying it was viable for 15 years. Now, of course, they're saying, nope, still viable. So yeah, store it, save it for your kids, save it for yourself or donate to somebody else. Excellent, well Jane, first of all, I know Ira Brin, one of our investors, brought you to us like four years ago to the first Startup Health Festival you attended. You've been a regular ever since. You're now a contributor to Startup Health Magazine. Thank you for your friendship. I know you're now a neighbor of Unity and Kachi's at yes. Berkeley. And Welcome so to Berkeley. you get to see them a lot, but we're really honored to um, not only be your friend, but really appreciate your contribution to our community. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, right. Please join me in thanking Jane for a wonderful talk. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Jane. Thank you.